Hey guys, lecture 9.5. Um, this may be the second last lecture for this part of the course, um, for, for A01 anyway, um, which is always weird. It always sneaks up a, a little bit somehow. Um, but somehow we are here. Uh, cheers, cup of tea to, to have while we chat. A lot, okay. Um, yeah, so we're getting to the end here of chapter nine. Um, it's still in the problem solving area. And in the last lecture, we talked a lot about the heuristic approach to problem solving, a much more sort of, um, well, certainly not rational, not logical. Uh, again, you know, making decisions or based on things like how easily something comes to mind or how much somebody seems to represent some category of person. Those were the examples we talked about. Um, here, we're gonna get more into the rational side. Um, so, you know, important again to always contextualize some of this and say, our, our, the oldest part of the brain, the oldest part of ourselves, is our emotional sort of reactive um, side, the kinds of things in the limbic system. The frontal lobes are the most recently evolved, and the frontal lobes is where we do a lot of our rational strategic thinking, our planning. Um, and one of the things you've already seen is that the frontal lobes have to fight for their uh, fight for their right to play a role, fight for the right to party in a sense, to play a role in our behavior. And quite often, um, they get swamped. It, it is like it's it's sort of the newest ability we have, uh, and and is we're thrown it into a house with a really strong, powerful sort of emotional reactive system. Um, and we often see that the the rational system uh, has to sort of yeah, really be deliberate uh, in order to have its uh, say in things. And uh, yeah, and that it's fragile uh, to an extent, that it can be, can give way to much more emotional, much more primitive ways of responding. Uh, and so we're going to see that in this story as well. So we're going to kind of continue on. Um, but if we go back to the Kirk versus Spock Remember, the Kirk was much more sort of emotion-based, primitive, reactive-based kind of side. That's what he was representing. And Spock is representing the, the logical, rational side. And in the context of Daniel Kahneman's thinking fast and thinking slow, um, he considered these rational processes slow. And, and let me just start there because that's an important point. Remember that, you know, as we evolved, we often had to make decisions very, very quickly. You know, we, we didn't necessarily have time to sit and think our way through a problem, not if that problem involved predators or, you know, some sort of life-threatening event we might find ourselves in. Um, we have to do something quick. And that previous system we've, we've talked about, that previous approach to decision-making is fast. You know, just, well, if something comes to mind, I think it's X. Uh, and so it, we, we call it cognitive shortcuts. Um, because it can provide you with a quick basis to make some decision. Um, that decision may not always be accurate uh, based on you know what you're using, depending on what you're using as the basis for it. Um, and so now we're going to turn to this other approach. You know, what if what if um, getting it right is really important? And that's where rational processes kind of kick in. In fact, uh, yeah, so we're going to be talking about logic. We're going to be talking about critical thought, one of my favorite things. Um, and here's the kind of context where those things uh, are important. So first of all, when the fairness of the decision is important, uh, and especially when emotions are kind of on the line, um, you know, we're, we're seeing things like uh, racial equity issues in, in our society. And, and the focus of some of those is that, you know, maybe some of the decisions that are made uh, within our communities are not made on the same basis in different communities. And, and maybe there are things creeping in um, like representativeness heuristics, et cetera, that are biasing the way people are making decisions in certain neighborhoods. Uh, and so when fairness is really important and, and when there's a lot of emotions on the line, we want to get our decisions right. We want to be able to defend them, which is going to be a big part of rational thought, the ability to justify the decisions you made, okay? Um, and so especially if errors are a big deal. And so I have the, my judicial mallet here because again, I often talk to judges about this stuff and there are errors are a big deal, right? Both ways. If you um, let a uh, guilty person go free, um, whatever that person, whatever crime that person originally committed, they're probably likely to commit uh, that crime again. And so you are putting a danger on the streets. 
if you jail an innocent person, um, you know, that's a big deal because you are ruining their life for no good reason. And so in situations like that, who am I going to put in jail and who am I going to put back on the street? Errors are a big deal. And so you really want to make sure your decisions are as, as sort of rationally founded as possible. Uh, and when the ability to justify a decision is important. Remember in your peer scholar activity, um, the third phase, the very last thing you did is I asked you to justify your decisions about reflections, uh, you know, when peers gave you advice. So did you follow what, what peer one said? Why or why not? If you did, how did you do it? But if you didn't, why did you not? Um, my asking you to justify the decisions you made there is, is my way of ensuring that you put some deep thought into those decisions, that you don't just make them based on, oh, I didn't like that guy, so I'm not doing what they said. You know, sometimes you don't like somebody, but they make a good point. They can help you. Uh, and, so, and so you can't allow, you know, the, your primitive self to rule in those situations. You have to bring your, your uh, rational self. Um, and when one, that should say one, when one is trying to change an incorrect but widely accepted way of being, um, social change. So, I mean, I have that TED talk um, that I've done in Norway, if you want to look at that, where I make this argument in detail. But the, but the very vague ar argument or general argument is sometimes when you're making decisions just based on that primitive emotional kind of basis, society on the whole can get something wrong. Um, so as an example, you know, that, that I talk about in some cases is um, if we look at situations like slavery in the States, um, you know, as it was occurring in the 1800s, let's say, um, it was so widespread in the States, owning slaves and treating them the way people did, that it seemed to everybody there to be normal just the way the world is. This is how things are. And they did not necessarily perceive themselves as, as being wrong uh, or unethical in any way, shape, or form. Um, if somebody thinks they are, and you really want to convince these people um, that they are, you better have a good argument. Um, you, you know, yes, you might use emotional devices and others to try to convince them. You don't necessarily only rely on the on the central root, right? On that on that um, conscious, um, rational thing, way to to, to um, change them. But if someone says, "Why? Why should we do it your way? What's wrong with slavery? Explain to me." If you don't have a good answer to that question, if you can't clearly specify what's wrong with it, then it's going to be very easy to blow you off. Uh, and so rational thought, critical thought can, uh, is very important for that, to be, to be able to explain you know, why some behavior, even if it's generally held by everybody, is, is inappropriate and should change. Uh, and so, you know, these are these are the reasons why I'm such a big fan of critical thought and I work so hard to try to teach you. Um, I, I think it's important that we learn to um, be the drivers uh, of our decision making and not let our not let our primitive brains just kind of decide what's going on uh, in some cases. In other cases, it's perfectly fine to let the primitive stuff do it. You know, we can't be rational about every decision we make, but these sorts of ones, it's important that we try to be rational. Now, that said, it's not easy. In fact, it's not even natural. Um, I really think this ability to kind of think through something and decompose it and really kind of consider it from multiple perspectives and come up with a rational analysis is, is kind of like playing guitar or dancing really well or um, playing a sport really, really well. Uh, it's, it's not something that we're born able to do and we only become good at doing it through practice of actually using that skill. And so now that you guys, you know, have had some psychology, I just want to, again, reiterate, and I've, I've touched on this a hint, but let's just reiterate as a chance to kind of, you know, know where we are with things. When we talked about, you know, why does somebody come to an opinion they have? Why do you believe the things you do? Um, and because your beliefs affect your decisions a lot, right? But a lot of your beliefs started with observational learning. You know, we saw that in language development, you know, right from, you know, those one and a half year old twins who are obviously mimicking social interactions they are seeing in the real world, even though they don't really understand what's happening at a deep level, they're seeing it at the, at the surface level and they're mimicking it. 
Uh, and, and we do that a lot. And so we come to um, act or believe what other people believe because they believe it, because they're around us and they believe it. And if a lot of people around us hold a certain view, we are very likely to mimic that and, and hold that view. Now, that's not rational thought, right? That's monkey see, monkey do. Um, now let's kind of say, okay, but this lays the foundation of our behaviors, mimicking others. But then we go out in the real world and we start behaving ourselves and our behaviors have consequences. And that brings us to operant conditioning, operant learning. So, you know, there's consequences to our behaviors and this now tweaks or evolves our behaviors. Things we do that have negative consequences, we're less likely to do again in that context. Things that have positive consequences, we're more likely to do in that consequence, in that context, sorry. So our, our behavior is being finely tweaked to be appropriate in different contexts, thanks to operant conditioning. But again, this isn't rational thought, right? Um, in fact, uh, Skinner himself, uh, you know, really didn't posit a lot of use for rational thought. He thought we were just justifying things to ourselves afterwards, but the real source of our behavior was just our reward his history, which we've kind of implicitly um, embodied. Uh, you know, we, we just naturally don't repeat things if they lead to bad, bad uh, results. Not because we consciously revisit the thing and go, oh, geez, last time I was in here, I did X and Y. Um, and that la it turned out that way. And so this time I think I'm going to do whatever, you know, Skinner said, no, no, no. You just get in the situation and the situation triggers a behavior based on its reward history. That's not rational thought. Uh, and so for example, if you live in the Southern United States in the 1800s, um, and if you decide to buy a slave, um, what's going to happen? Are you going to be punished? By your peers for doing that? Or are you going to be applauded for doing that? Chances are at that time you would be applauded. That This would be seen as going out and buying a nice car or something like that, that, that you had the means to do that. Um, and there was, and the fact that you were subjugating another human being wasn't part of the consideration. And so society was rewarding um, people for having slaves. It was probably rewarding them for treating them badly. Um, it didn't, you know, people didn't see that as, as a problem at the time. And so this is where, you know, if society gets it wrong, then what's, what's really getting wrong is the reward contingencies that society gives. And that's encouraging new people to adopt those same behaviors because that's what's rewarded and punished. Again, it's not rational thought. It's just the reward contingencies. So where does rational thought fit in? You know, it really isn't something we naturally um, uh, have. And, and so we have to, we have to learn it. We have to experience it for, for some people, by the way, um, there are important events in their life. For me, for example, when I was young, computers were just coming out and they were really cool. They had like video games and they were nothing like today's video games, I tell you. Um, but then you could start to think, wow, I can create video games. I can take this, this machine and I can make it do really kind of cool things. But yeah, in order to do that, I really now have to structure my thinking. I have to follow a logical path of events. I have to tell it things using a very strict logical approach. And I think for me, my interactions with computers and programming some of the original ones really showed me the value of rational thought and logical thought and exercised it constantly. Um, I think my programming made me a better thinker for sure. I also think when I hit graduate school, by the way, I got a lot of training in critical thought because in graduate school, we were constantly challenged. Why did you design the experiment that way? Isn't there a better way to do this? You think you have this theory that says your data says X, but aren't there other theories? Couldn't it be Y? And so we were constantly challenged um, and, and therefore had to be able to, again, justify the decisions we'd made um, to people who were kind of coming at us in our face. And, and I think I learned a lot of critical thinking there. Um, and so those are the kind of contexts. And, and I, I really believe that we need to develop this, that the world is too emotion based right now. Um, I think we've seen that uh, and are seeing that uh, south of the border quite, quite obviously. Um, and we need some rational thought to kind of counterbalance some of that. Emotions will always play a big sway. I have no worry that emotional responding will ever go away, but we need to, we need to complement it with rational thought, but it's not natural. It's not natural. And so it shouldn't be surprising that we find it challenging when we go doing experiments uh, on it. So here's, whoops, here's, um, 
some of those experiments just to give you a sense and, and it'll show you the difficulty humans have. So I wanted to get you with this one before the textbook um, did, so I think I did here. Um, we can test people's ability to use logic. Um, and, and one of the things we found is humans are okay with logic as long as it's very concrete. As soon as it gets abstract, they start to have trouble. So here's the abstract case. And I'm just going to give you this rule. Imagine there's a rule. If a card has a vowel on one side, then it must have an even number on the other. That's a rule. Here's four cards. Does that rule hold for these four cards? And specifically, if you wanted to test that, which cards would you have to turn over to verify if the rule is correct? So, so think about all of these and think, you know, do I need to turn over that card to test the rule? This one, this one, this one. So let me just let you think about that for a second and I'll have a drink of tea. Okay, let's start with card one. Do we have to flip over card one? Well, yeah, we kind of do, right? Um, because if it has a, a vowel on one side, and this does, it has an A, then it must have an even number. So if we flip over card one and there's an odd number, then we know the rule doesn't hold, right? Almost everybody sees that, it's not a problem. Do you need any others? What, what about the rest? What if I tell you there's one other that you must? Which one? So maybe you can come to a guess, but do you really understand why? Okay, and so the other one you have to turn over is card four. Let's just go through them uh, and we'll get to card four. Card two is irrelevant, right? Because the rule is if it has a vowel on one side, it must have an even number. Well, this is not a vowel, so it can have even or odd. So turning this over won't tell us anything right? Um, the rule holds no matter what's on the other side of this one. What about this one? If it has a vowel on one side, it must have an even number. Well, it has an even number. So if we flip it over and there's a vowel, that's all cool. But if we flip it over and, a, and there's a consonant, that's cool too, right? Because there's, the rule doesn't say anything about consonants. Consonants can have an even number on the other side. So, so this doesn't, so these middle two don't tell us anything. This one, however, is the one that most people find tricky. If it has a vowel on one side, it must have an even number on the other. Well, this has an odd number. So if you flip this over and there's a vowel on the other side, the rule's wrong, right? So this has information value. So card one, if we flip it over and there's an, uh, an odd number, the rule's wrong. If we flip this one over and there's a consonant, the rule's wrong. So these two have value. These two we can flip over and it won't tell us anything. So if you found that difficult, and a lot of people do, um, everybody gets card number one and a very few people get card number four. But if you suddenly make a change to it, here's, here's the change. Imagine you're like a, a drinking inspector and you can walk into drinking establishments and, and you're you're making sure this rule holds that if a person is drinking alcohol, that person must be over 21 years old. So in Canada, it would be more like, what is it now? 18, 19, something like that. Um, and so you come in and you, you see these people here. Who do you want to talk to and check out? Well, now suddenly it seems easy. Well, this person having a beer, yeah, you better make sure they're over 21. Right, so we want to check out one person drinking a Coke. Anybody can drink a Coke. This 35 year old, this 35 year old can drink anything they want. This person, however, you're going to want to check out because they're too young to be drinking alcohol. And if it turns out you flip over and they're drinking alcohol, you got a problem, right? When we do it this way, this is the same problem as the other one. But as soon as you do it this way, and as soon as people can think of these numbers as ages, and on the other side is what they're drinking, then it becomes pretty obvious to them what, what to do. Uh, and so the, the moral from this is we can think logically, we can think through things logically, but we often really need it to be a concrete kind of thing. If it gets abstract, it gets very hard. To the extent I'm a good teacher, it's because I'm not good at abstract thought. <laughs> As a student, 
I was the student that was constantly raising my hand and saying, I'm sorry, professor, can you give me an example of the, of, of that concept you just described? Uh, because I needed that. I, I needed somebody to, to make things concrete for me. And if they could give me a clear, concrete example of something, then I could suddenly understand it. I could grasp it. But if it stayed abstract, I had a lot of trouble. And, and so now when I teach, I think I feel that same way. Oh, I'm, I'm hitting you guys up with some abstract concept. I'd better bring in an example. I'd better bring in something to try to you know, help you think about it. Uh, and so I think that's become a part of my teaching is to continually connect it with real world things or, or to do something that makes you see the relevance or, or concreteness of, of the issue. Um, and, and that's because that's where we all are. We, we can think rationally as long as it's concrete. It's really hard when it's abstract. Now we have people like Einstein who can do that, right? And that was his his forte, was thinking in this very rational way, but in this very abstract world he created in his mind of like twins going the speed of light, stuff like that. Okay, so that's one of the tests we use. There's another one, I'll just mention it really quickly. Um, the, you've seen these things before, they're called syllogisms. Um, we can test logical thinking this way. And, and this is another example of the power of that more primitive self to kind of get in the way of logical thinking. So these are examples I give to my judges. And the way these work, my judges, I, yeah, whatever. The way these work um, is you're supposed to accept the first two premises as true and then decide whether the conclusion follows from the premises. So all judges are angry, that's a premise. Felix is a judge. That's a premise. So if you assume those two things are true, does it follow that Felix is angry? And the answer is yes. Uh, when it, with these syllogisms, words like all are very important. So you got to read them very carefully. But if all judges are angry, and if Felix is a judge, then Felix is angry. Okay, that follows. When you give this to judges, they have trouble endorsing this. They have trouble saying, yes, that's true. And why? because they have trouble accepting this premise, all judges are angry. So as soon as you start with something you're not sure you believe or that you don't believe, the logic system gets wiped out um, because suddenly you can't sort of put that on hold. You're like, yeah, but all judges aren't angry. Um, and so, you know, as soon as a, some of the information that's in your logical analysis conflicts with your pre-existence be existing beliefs, your beliefs kind of win out. Uh, here's another example I give them. Some judges have manners. All people with manners are respected. Therefore, most judges are respected. Um, the most doesn't follow. However, most judges are respected. Um, and so they hear that conclusion and they think, yeah, that's their, their pre-existing belief is that's true. And so even though this does not follow from those premises, if it, if it had said um, some judges are respected, then it would have followed. But once it goes to most, that doesn't fit with the premises. But again, they will tend to accept that. So, so I'm putting this in the judge context. But this is just a more general idea that when we're trying to think in a very logical way, our pre-existing beliefs can hijack the whole process and, and kind of get in the way, even if they're wrong. Right away, you know, and that's the problem is that we might be using logic to, to understand that our pre-existing beliefs that say slavery is okay um, are wrong. Uh, and so we have to follow the logic even if, if it conflicts with our current beliefs because the logic might demand a, a change in our beliefs. Our beliefs might be wrong, um, but that's really hard. So when somebody already holds a belief, it's hard to change their mind. So, you know, here, here's the, the classic example I would give you here is once again, back to the conspiracy theorists um, that, that are around now, and they hold a bunch of beliefs. Um, and, and these beliefs are some sort of global authoritarian, whatever, trying to make everybody um, dance to their whims or something like that. And so if you believe that, and now if you start saying to them, okay, let's think about this logically. Let's, let's think about the things that have to be true um, if your belief system is accurate. And as you start logically thinking about things, you can point out things that are really hard to accept. So for example, if there's this great conspiracy, and for example, let's say there is no pandemic, let's just focus on that. There really is no pandemic. All these numbers we see are fake, they're made up. 
Well, then you say to them, okay, let's, let's take that belief, but let's say the following. Where do we get our numbers? Where are these numbers coming from? Oh, they're coming from hospitals and, and centers of health. And, you know, they flow from the hospital to various regional um, computational centers, which then pass them on to a more national one. And, and that's how they all get there. So if, if the numbers are not to be trusted, um, and, and if, I mean, keep in mind, too, we're also seeing scenes of hospitals being overwhelmed and all that kind of stuff. So, so if this is true, then what must be going on? The only way what we're seeing could be true is, this, is if all pretty much the whole healthcare community is lying to us. Really, hospitals are fine. It's all quiet in the hospitals. There's no real COVID cases. Um, they're just maybe shooting little dramatic videos where it looks like there's a bunch of stuff going on. And then there's some sending numbers that say, you know, hey, in Ontario, 1,200 new cases yesterday or whatever. But that's all bull crap. Um, okay, if that's all bull crap, then this whole profession, a profession of, of young people like yourselves who have gotten where they've gotten because they care and want to help other people, we have to believe that they're all in on it and they're all lying. Um, and we don't even understand why, what is, what's their motivation for doing this. But, but just starting with that, that they're all lying. You know, you would think with a rational, logical thought, you could talk to somebody and say, that, that just doesn't make sense, right? Like, you know, doctors and nurses, like, and, and first of all, how could they all organize themselves that way? That just doesn't make sense. So that should be enough to make your theory fall down. Uh, but no, no, um, they believe what they believe. And so therefore, any logic or rational thought is put aside. Um, and it's just about holding on, clinging on to the belief, looking for little bits of data, confirmation bias that support what they what they want to say, and not doing a rational, logical analysis of how they got where they got. That's that's how things work um, in, in, in humanity. We are still emotional beings, and, and our beliefs are strongly tied to our emotional perspective on things, and they can win out. So it's kind of funny, you know, this section is about rational thought, but what we end up telling you mostly is that we're not very good at it. Um, you know, it's, it's a bit of a problem. Yeah, so, you know, how do we convince people then to say follow COVID rules? Let's say people, um, you know, are, are against it. Um, you, the anti-maskers, let's say, people like that. How can you convince an anti-masker? Uh, and I get asked this by the media quite a bit, you know, what should we be doing? And I tell them, rational thought probably isn't going to help. Um, they're so dug in that, that we can try to do the arguments. And that's what the natural thing is for us to do is to say, oh, come on, let's talk about this. Let's blah, blah, blah. But it's probably not going to work. So if rational thought isn't going to work. And, and let's be less extreme. There's the real dug in anti-maskers, but there's also the people that are, you know, breaking the rules on a lower scale, having parties with other friends, you know, doing those sort of hanging out in the house without masks with, with people not in your, in your group. What could we do for all of these people to try to convince them, you know, rather than attacking them, rather than snitching on them, rather than whatever, we would like them on our side. We would like their help. Um, how can we convince them that they should be on our side if we can't use rational thought. I've got a, a video here. We're going to watch it together. Um, I, I was going to just link it below, but let's let's watch it together because I think it's a really powerful video, and I want to talk about it afterwards. So so let's do that. And come back. So as a story, I just confess that I text and drive. <laughs> if I get a text, I look at my phone. It's definitely texting. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat. I do Snapchat and drive sometimes. Look at their emotions. Is that like making Snapchats or watching them? What making them? A texting is like my main form of communication. Boredom, honestly. And B, well, no, nah, I guess no. It's really just A. <laughs> I've only never done it at stoplights. I've always been really good about it. The passenger has a pretty important role driving now where they're like, oh, red light, red light. If someone that you like texts you, you're like, you can't just like let it sit there without just knowing. So, so I want, I want, so they're all talking about texting and stuff while driving, right? And, and what I want you to really key on right now is their sort of emotional state. So they're being a little confess, you know, the guy at the first is, so I just have to confess to this stuff. Um, but they're, but, but look at where they're at emotionally. They're, not proud of themselves, but they're certainly not shameful. 
in any sense, right? And so this, this is the emotion they have connected to that behavior right now. What they said is what if something exciting is happening or something happened? Like every time I do it, I kind of, I think about it, I'm like, why am I doing this? And then I just keep doing it. So I'd like to, like, want to introduce you to a friend of ours. My name is Jacey. Hi, Alexis. Hi, Dash. Justin, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I just really quickly want to have a chat, tell you what happened to me. When I was 21 years old, driving home from my college graduation ceremony. Driver on his phone was so distracted, he turned left into the intersection at a red light. Another car, an 18-wheeler, swerved to miss him and hit my family's car. And the resulting collision actually killed both of my parents. I spent two months in the hospital fighting for my own life, and then two more months in a rehab hospital, learning how to walk again, learning how to speak again, learning how to dress myself and how to feed myself. I live with a partially paralyzed body. I didn't have my daddy to walk me down the aisle when I got married. What do you feel right now? <laughs> I feel it, right? That's that's emotion, right? That's your limbic system. That's your sympathetic nervous system kind of rising up. That's what they're all feeling. We're seeing it very clearly. I mean, I even feel uh, a hint of te tears in my eyes from this and I'm a little choked up. She's not telling these people anything they don't know already, anything they didn't know when they walked in. What she's doing is making them understand at an emotional level the consequences, the potential consequences of their behavior. Um, that's all she's doing. That's all she's doing. Having sort of like met JC, because you look at JC and sort of give those same reasons. Oh. Usually I use my phone to change a, a song on. I try, I try to use it as little as possible. But you sensing a little more shame? I'm not going to look at my phone ever again. Honestly, if I have been sitting at a red light, I'll like glance down to see if my mom's texting me, but the people's lives that are impacted from something that is so stupid. I can assure you on my drive home right now, I'm not going to use my phone and drive, and I'm not gonna do it when I go to work tomorrow and the next day after that until you know it becomes a habit and that just doesn't happen at all. I know this is hard, and I'm sorry. It's hard for me too, but you know this is real. You have the power to really actually make a difference and do something about it. Yeah, there you go. So I wanted to kind of end this lecture with that um, because you can read this passionately uh, about, you know, decisions we make and, and why we make them and the things that push us to do X or Y. Um, and when we can say, yeah, some of these are more primitive emotion based, some of them are much more rational, logical based. Um, when, it, when it comes to questions of influencing people, Emotion works better sometimes. Um, you know, as critical thinking of a guy I am, and as much as I promote that, and as much as I do believe that will help you in terms of your life, um, you know, making good decisions, being impressing your boss, and and having a family life that, that's good, all those things, I think critical thought and all those uh, other things are important for that. But at the core, we're emotional creatures. 
and and there are times where rational critical thought doesn't work very well at those times emotion may still work very well and you know i've been i've been telling um a, a number of media outlets that we need to have ads like this about covid we need to have an ad that shows you know somebody your age being invited out to a social event that you know at some level will probably lead to rule breaking um we need stories like this woman's stories of someone who's done that and the impact that that has had on on their family or other families or etc because that's what i think we sometimes miss in the moment you know we fall into the habits and everything seems okay and then more people aren't wearing their masks and that's just kind of how it is and so we go along with that all this psychology of conformity that you're going to learn about uh, in social psychology um, and, and so how you can counter that is you, you want to, you know, I'd like to create an ad where when that person gets the invite, which is when they're still most in control of the situation, can we do something that will make them think about the potential emotional consequences uh, of saying yes at that point? Uh, because that's when they're most rational and most, uh, they're not going to be captured by habit. They're not going to be surrounded by peers behaving a certain way. And if we can make them understand the importance of making the right decision then, then I think we could get a lot more rule following, which I think would defeat the virus sooner, which would allow us to get back to the life we want sooner. Um, and so, you know, that's that's my pitch to all of you guys, I guess. But but in the more general sense, I think this is just a great example that I have to keep reminding myself that as much as I might swear by a critical thought, emotion can kick its butt all the time um, in, in a regular basis. Uh, and, and that's probably one of the most powerful examples I saw of that. So I know I've got you guys all crying. Ho hopefully you're not, <laughs> you're, you're going to think twice about texting and driving. Hopefully we hit that as well. And maybe you'll think twice about some of the COVID kind of stuff. Alrighty. Cool. I am going to finish up with now here. Um, and I'm starting in my head to plan sort of the final lecture where I want to try to you know, highlight some of the things we've been through um, and and make you kind of have an understanding of the, of the core things you've learned through this course. Um, and um, yeah, prepare you for your next step, which will be Psych AO2. One of the things you'll see at the very end of this section is I've introduced you to a couple of more people in your neighborhood. Um, one of those people is Kyle Danielson. Uh, I saved him for last uh, because Kyle will be your professor in Psych AO2. So I thought, um, you know, good chance to introduce him to you at that time. Um, so make sure you watch that one and get to know Kyle a little bit as well. That's all I got for you for now. See you guys.